Western expansion and industrialization. The first part of this deals with reconstruction. Okay? Remember, reconstruction is to do what? Rebuild what? Whoever just said the South needs to slap themselves. <laughs> We're going to rebuild the Union. Okay, the Union. Reconstruction means to rebuild or put back together the Union, the country. Lincoln's 10% plan is a plan to gently bring the nation back together. 10% of the voters in 1860 have to swear an oath of allegiance to the United States and the state can re-enter the Union, okay? So is its purpose to punish Southern generals to bring the South back into the Union or to give black rights? The answer is B, okay? Lincoln could have cared less about giving blacks rights. That's the radical Republican element. People like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner wanted blacks to have rights. The Freedmen's Bureau was created by Congress before the end of the Civil War. The goal was to make the transition from slavery to freedom easier for blacks by providing jobs or helping them find jobs, by helping them with food, and by setting up schools to educate them. Okay? For adult blacks, school was not really an option because they needed to work to support themselves and their families. But Freedmen's schools were really important for children. People like Booker T. Washington was very well educated thanks to Freedmen's schools. The only bad part about Freedmen's schools, and that it probably would have happened anyway, was it really set up a separate black and white school system. Johnson's plan of reconstruction was called restoration. It was much like Lincoln's, except it insinuated that instead of 10%, it would be 50%. And it said no one who owned more than $20,000 worth of property could um, swear the oath of allegiance. So he took the rich mucky mucks out of the equation in the South, mainly because he didn't like them personally. He was a Southerner who had made it from poverty into wealth. Uh, radical or Congressional Reconstruction did what? It was more punitive or punishing of the South. It made them write into their constitutions the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. It divided the South up into districts that were ruled by military governors. Um, it reinforced the, the fact that Southern states would be occupied by troops. Um, and it guaranteed blacks the right to vote, to take part in government, those kinds of things. And that was really important to radical Republicans. Um, the U.S. Army did what in the decade after the Civil War? Okay, listen to your choices. They did what in the decade after the Civil War? A, um, occupied the West. B, occupied the South. C, fought in Hawaii, D, um, lived in Boston, or E, took over Cuba? The answer they're going for is occupied the South, okay? So from 1865 to 1877, you have this occupation by the military. Were, there, were they out west? Oh yeah, they were trying to round up the Indians. Think of Custer roaming around trying to round up the Indians. What did the grandfather clause do? It attempted to keep blacks from voting by making it that you could only vote if your grandpa had voted in 1860, could you vote? Okay. And the assumption was that if you were white, your grandpa voted. If you were black, grandpa was a slave and didn't vote. Civil Rights Act of 1866 is the forerunner to the 14th Amendment. It's what Congress passes until the 14th Amendment goes into effect to guarantee um, rights of citizenship to black men and women. Um, and the only way that you lost those citizenship rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was that the courts took them away from you because you were a convict or whatever. Um, Ku Klux Klan. 
a little organization which was founded to intimidate blacks, hopefully keep them from voting, taking places in government, that kind of thing. As long as the troops occupied the South, the KKK wasn't real successful, but after 1877 when they had redemption, they made sure blacks didn't vote. What happened to blacks after the war? Most of them stayed in the neighborhood where they had been slaves. They even stayed on the farm where they had been slaves, and they became sharecroppers. Um, a huge percentage of white and most black southerners were sharecroppers or tenant farms by 1900. I still owned the thousand acres I had before, and you all worked for me to do it so I could keep my land. Sharecropping means, or tenant farming, what is it? I own the land, you do the work, I get 50% of the crop. You get 50% of the crop, okay? The effect of sharecropping is that it continues or perpetuates that whole class system in the South, where you have these few rich people and the rest are probably pretty poor. It um, provided blacks with a with a way to make an income, albeit a very poor one. Because remember that many blacks had assumed before the end of the Civil War that they would receive 40 acres and a mule for free, so they would own their own land. That didn't happen, okay? Um, crop lien system, when the war ends in the South, no one has money. White Southerners have turned their money, their silver and gold, into Confederate dollars. Is Haley? No, it's just rainy. Oh, it was Haley. It was Haley last year, but it's not right now. Um, anyway, nobody had any money, and you had to buy seed and supplies to grow a new crop, so you had to borrow money against your future crop. That's what lean is. You borrow against something, okay? In this case, you borrow against a future crop. What happens with the crop lien system is you come to me, I, I'm a banker or a small businessman, I loan you $100 so you can buy your seed and all that. At the end, it's going to be 20% interest, so at the end of the season, you're going to owe me $120. Okay, you sell your crop and you can only pay me back $80, so now you owe me $40 plus what do you have for next year? Nothing, so now you've got to borrow another $100 for next year. So now you're borrowing $140, you're going to owe me $174 at the end of the season. Do you see it's a cycle of perpetual debt, which has been a problem with the South since the Civil War is that whites and blacks together have lived in poverty. Um, grant scandals, sometimes referred to as grantisms. Was this, did they involve Grant himself? No, they involved people that he was friends and relatives with. The whiskey ring involved his personal secretary who accepted bribes from whiskey companies so they didn't have to pay the excise tax. Um, the Credit Mobiliere involved his vice president, Skylar Colfax, who was part of a fraudulent, fake construction company, railroad construction company. They sold you stock in company A that didn't even exist and you never got any return on your money. Fisk and Gould were friends of Grant's who along with Grant's brother-in-law tried to corner the, silver, the gold market, they, which would drive the price of gold up and they hoped to, to drive it up to a point up here and then sell it and make a killing. Before they could drive it up far enough for them, the government infused a whole bunch of gold into the system and it drove the price down and Fisk and Gould lost their shirts. Uh, the Panic of 1873, the fourth panic of the time period, the 1800s, caused totally by over-speculation on railroads, in railroad stock and building railroads, etc. 